Jabula New Life Ministries presents Bishop Tudor Bismarck. Bishop Bismarck is an apostolic voice to the nations with a clear message, building God's kingdom and empowering God's people. Today's teaching will unlock some kingdom principles that will give you access to the life God originally designed for you to live. You'll be challenged to possess the promises of God for your life. And now, please join Bishop Bismarck for this dynamic message. Uh, we're going to deal with levels of authority. I want to deal with the prophetic and levels of authority from some sort of an angle. Uh, Romans 13, Romans 13. Let's go to Romans chapter number 13, verse 1. Let every soul say that. What does that mean? It means every person. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Say the higher powers. the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. The Dewey uh, Reims Bible says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but from God. Those that are are ordained by God. The Derby Bible translation let every soul be subject to the authorities that are above him. Let every soul be subject to the authorities that are above him. For there is no authority except from God. For those that exist are set up by God. I love that version. That's a great Bible. It's a great Bible. The World English Bible. The World English Bible, I think I have 17 versions of the Bible here. The World English Bible. Let every soul be in subjection to the higher authorities. In subjection to the higher authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are ordained by God. Everyone say, every soul. Every soul. Subject. To the higher powers or higher authorities. All right. The Young's literal translation: Let every soul be, let every soul to the higher authorities be subject. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities existing are appointed by God. I like that version too. What is authority? Authority comes from the word author. Author. And an author is an originator. Jesus is the author, the originator, and the finisher of our faith. So the root word for authority is the word author, somebody that begins it. So authority then connotes the rules laid up by the originator. So when somebody invents, invents a thing, they set up the rules or the regulations and regulations, or regulations by which the thing they have invented is to be governed by. So authority then, from the Greek word, translate authorities or powers, comes from the word exousia. And there's various words for power, which is uh, words like kratos, there's pneuma, there's dunamis. But in this particular case, the word here is exousia. Exousia. Which has uh, an intent in terms of the Greek word oxosia, to deal with demonic or spiritual forces. Spiritual forces. Why submit to spiritual authority? We're going to breeze through this. First of all, Paul says that if we resist God's leaders, that you are all in, that in all respects you are resisting God. And so any authority, any power, any authority that there is, whatever it is, whether it's electricity, whether it's police, School teacher, pastor, choir director, music as written notes, any authority is ordained, authorized, and given by God. It's delegated. So those who resist will receive damnation. The word damnation there is judgment. So any authority you resist or fight against, you're just getting yourself in trouble. Now sometimes when you can't get into a breakthrough in your life, if you can't get a breakthrough... Chances are you are dealing with an authority or a law that you need to break through. In the world of aviation, when you break the sound barrier at 600 miles per second, you know, the other day I was driving from Wange, 
when I left Bulawayo, I just opened the sunroof. And at about 130, I wasn't going fast, about 130 on cruise control, I just put both my hands through the window, the sunroof, and I could feel the air pushing my hands back. And when you're traveling at 600 miles an hour, the air can't get out the way fast enough for the speed of that vehicle, that plane. And so the speed starts, the air starts gathering as a wall in front of the nose of the plane. They call that the demon wall. And, and because that air becomes like a brick wall, a steel wall, everything that's pushing against it starts to vibrate. And Chuck Yeager, in 1948, called that the demon wall. But when he began to push greater on that wall at 700, at that height it was 746 miles per hour, the speed of sound is 750 miles per hour, but at that height, at that altitude, it was 748, 748, whatever, 47. When they broke through that, he began to recognize that there was a law, and to supersede that law, there were certain things that had to be applied. So anytime in your life there's resistance, it, it needn't be demonic, can be, it needn't be demonic, it needn't be God not permitting you to go to the next level, it needn't be that, it needn't be witchcraft or a mother-in-law or whatever the case might be, mushrooms in your food, it needn't be that. Sometimes it's just a law that you have to understand a little better. And Einstein discovered some of those, you know, and so on and so forth, Thomas Edison, etc. They found certain laws, and when they broke through that law, everything is now permissible. But if you violate that law, you're going to get stung. And so the Bible calls it damnation. We need not be afraid to submit to godly authority if our hearts are dedicated to God. So any authority God gives, if we submit to it, if it's godly authority, godly authority can be anything. The, your school teacher, that's godly authority. God put it there. The police in a nation, that's godly authority. Whether it's a Muslim nation, a Shintoist nation, a Buddhist nation, all of those authorities are ordained by God because those authorities, even though they're not people that are born again necessarily, what they're doing is they are keeping at bay crime or demonic activity or deliberately keeping the petri dish of demonic reproduction at a limit. So... Police in different countries, our authority is ordained by God, but they don't have to be Christians. A school teacher in Afghanistan doesn't have to be a Christian, but they are an authority, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. So, why godly authority? Why submit to spiritual authority? Number two, godly authority is actually our servant if we desire to do what is right. So any authority is designed to serve you, any authority, whatever it is, any authority. Whatever the authority is, whatever it is, it's desired to serve you. 60 kilometers an hour on the highway is designed to serve you. If we do evil, the same authority will become an avenger to execute God's wrath upon us in every level. What is clear of godly authority is how it is meant to function in the body of Christ. And this is when we're dealing with spiritual authority. Additionally, each one of us, uh, each one of the points above can be supported by numerous scriptures, etc., etc. Why submit to spirituality? The main reason why we must submit to or be subject to godly authority is, number one, because of the wrath of God or the fear of God's judgment, because of conscience. The commanded blessings are released. And number four, so that order in every sphere of human existence can prevail. That's why we submit to authority. Because of God's wrath, because of conscience. Number three, because the commanded blessings are released. And number four, so that order in every sphere of human existence prevails. Who are authorities? Who are authorities? Well, in Romans chapter number 13, verse 1, the interlinear text read, let every soul be subject to authorities. That's authorities above them. So the most crucial question in this particular presentation is, who are these authorities? Okay? So who are the exousia, or authorities, that Paul is referring to in the verse? So number one, Christians and believers. These, these, uh, these are authorities in the world. In the world. Man-made civil authorities of the world. So firstly, it's for us as believers. 
It's the structure of the church, which we're coming to tonight. Authority that we have in the world, from governmental authority to now man-made civil governments, etc. Governments of the world uh, have been quick to place their stamp of approval uh, on an interpretation of God-given authority in government. And, of course, you know, I was listening to President Obama. He's addressing, or was addressing earlier today, the House of Commons and the House of Lords in Westminster Hall. And that is a type of government. It's supposed to be a monarch. It's not a republic. And they have an election. They have a prime minister and so on and so forth. In our country, is a different type of government. In Swaziland, it's a different type of government. But all of those are authorities that have been approved by God. From the original Greek text, Paul is referring to authorities. He was specifically referring to civil government included in that authority. And it is necessary for us to believe that all the authorities or powers that Paul was actually referring to in Romans was dealing with the body of Christ in the city of Rome, which was the seat of uh, the Roman Empire. Because if you were serving as a Jew in Rome at that time as a believer, chances are you were a slave. And chances are you were serving as a servant in Caesar's system, some of them in Caesar's house. He said, salute the believers in Caesar's house. And so there was a general teaching and belief among some of them that when you become a Christian, you're not subject to Caesar. Especially when Caesar was killing them, putting them in uh, arenas where gladiators were, you know, killing Christians and lions were sent out there to tear them up, and some of them were being sawn asunder. It said that pregnant women were having their babies gouged out, and uh, wild boars were feeding out of them. And so the Apostle Paul now is dealing with the levels of authority, and he's saying that you must be subject to these powers. And it's very difficult for a believer to think that Caesar, who was doing some evil things, that he was ordained of God. It's very difficult to come with that, so Paul was dealing with some of that. But he was also then placing within significant uh, positions the ecclesia, the ecclesia, the council of God, the elders in the body of Christ. Who are these authorities? Civil governments of this world really, if ever, meet the basic three points of what we expect of them, which Paul was listing, and we might not get a chance to go through those. Who are these authorities? Number one, rulers, those that God has placed in authority to administer the kingdom over the invisible world the visible and the invisible world. And they range from all kinds of things. Okay? So we have godly and perverse authority. The devil has authority in the world, but we don't subject ourselves to his authority. He's a higher power, but we don't subject ourselves to his authority. We subject ourselves to God's kingdom authority. God has his own government, which operates under his authority. It's the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. As his followers, we are expected to submit to that authority which is invested in his leaders. Now, we're going to deal with some differentiations here in a minute, okay? When we're dealing with levels of authority, if we get there. Models of authority. Paul gives us a list of different models that were listed of authority. Okay, we're going to God's authority now. We're just breezing because of what I want to get to, all right? Paul gives us a list of five things that exist in terms of authority. All of the lists are different. And so in these lists, there are a number of uh, specific authorities that are common. So the first one we'll find is in Romans chapter number 12, 6 to 8. There Paul lists seven different authorities or gifts. The second list Paul lists is in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 8 through, 9, 8 through 13, actually. And there he lists nine different gifts, charis gifts, charis gifts. Number three, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, 28 through 30, Paul lists a group of eight there. I like this one because it says, and God gave set, he set some in the church, firstly apostles, secondly prophets, then teachers, then he begins to list miracles, etc., etc., the fourth list is in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 29. In that verse, in that series of verses, Paul lists a different seven. 
Ephesians chapter number 4 verse 11, Paul lists five. Everybody say five. Everybody say five again. Five. Apostles, evangelists, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now watch. Let's look at some of this list. With all of these lists of these various scriptures that we put together, the apostle lists them as apostles, word of wisdom, prophets, ministry of prophecy, word of knowledge. Now what we're trying to list them in is in the order of some of their importance. Faith, evangelists, teachers, exhortation, miracles, healing, pastors, gifts of giving, ruling and governing gifts, diverse tongues, helps, gifts of mercy, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits. All of these listing of gifts, which are both charis and ascension gifts of empowerment, all of these gifts fall into the category of authorities. Okay, just work with me. We're breezing now. Okay, the Apostle Paul begins to deal with, in uh, Romans chapter number 12 and verse 4, he begins to deal with certain things concerning powers that are good and powers that are given to serve us. So then we have rulers, now we have powers that are servants. These authorities are servants. Everyone say an authority? He's a servant. Every authority. Say it, every authority. He's a servant. Say that. Say the whole thing. Say that again. It's never meant to be dictatorial. It's meant to serve. Every authority in any area, in any capacity, is meant to serve. If a person is a doctor, medical doctor, that authority is meant to... A policeman is meant to... An educationalist, a teacher, or a professor in school is meant to... Any authority, the president of a country, a cabinet minister, a government minister, a senator, a governor, a provincial leader, a district superintendent, a general superintendent, a presbyter, a bishop. All of these are meant to... The one that is greatest among you is the servant of all. So every authority is meant to serve, whether it's an authority as a husband, a father, a wife, a mother, a grandfather, a grandmother, an authority on the keyboards, an authority on the drums, an authority in the soprano section. Every authority is given to serve. Say that. Every authority is given to now, if you've ever been given authority in any area, it's never ever to lord, it's always to serve. My dad used to cut hair. He was a barber. My dad cut hair for years. You know, he always did our hair. And so when I grew up, you know, when we had boys, I used to cut the boys' hair. Uh, but I remember the first time I cut hair in Mbakwe. Everyone say Mbakwe. And so uh, I went, this year I went to school with these clippers, you know, those, you, you wind like this. And so I cut Marshall Williams' hair. And I thought I gave him a good haircut. But somebody, when I look back, it was a, we, actually they named him Pitches. Because it was, I mean, I thought it was a great haircut. <laughs> And so I was trying to create some business in the boys' hostel. You know, it's like there you don't get paid with money. It's like you pay me with a bun. You pay me with jam, a bit of margarine. <laughs> you know? They used to serve carrots on Thursdays and oranges on Fridays. So it's like you give me an orange, peanuts on Saturdays. You know, you, get a, you used to get like two spoons of peanuts. We used to get white bread or white bun on a Sunday and with jam. Other days it was just a dry bun. I don't eat pork because those days you serve poloni. My God, it was as pink as that T-shirt over there. <laughs> Traumatized. And then because, because I went to, a, went to a, a Catholic school, I gravitated towards a convent girl. Amen. So it's Father Chichi and Sister Chichi. Amen. <laughs> Father Bismarck and Nun Chichi. Amen. But all of those authorities are given to serve. Every authority. Every authority. Every authority, whatever it is, is given to serve. Say that. Say that again. Say if a person is an authority in hairdos, it's to serve. If it's in cooking, it's to serve. Whatever it is, 
Every authority is given to serve. Say that. So then Paul uses this word to describe authorities in verse 1. It strongly supports that an authority that's given is given to serve. Incidentally, it's the same root word, diokonate, is the same root word as the word for the word deacon, given to serve. Given to serve. Servants. A true leader of God's people will be a servant of all. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. So Paul's description of authorities as the word diakonis means to serve. And it reinforces God's intent for the greatest among us being the servant of all. This is how this works. I may not be able to sing. I only get to sing in this church because I'm the bishop. So I just force myself to sing to you and you are forced to listen. There are certain things, everybody in this room, every person in this room is inferior to me in some way. At the same token, every person in this room is superior to me. The person on your left and on your right is inferior and superior. Say to the person next to you, you are inferior and you are superior. <laughs> you are my superior. Tell somebody you are my superior. Don't add the word mother in front of it. You are my superior. So in the areas you are my superior, new life's got talent. That's where your gift then doesn't lord, but it serves. It serves. So there was a lady here that got sick the other day. We prayed for her because that's what I do. And of course, they checked out her medical condition. And a doctor did that. You definitely don't want somebody that is a mechanic checking on somebody that fainted. Because he'll be like tightening her nose with the pliers. So the person that's the Mercedes dealer... His gift serves. It's the chiefest among us. But that same person mustn't cut hair. So you don't want somebody that works on ears to prescribe your glasses. Etc., etc. Because we could have a problem. So the chiefest among us must be our servant. And if we have the sense, if we have the sense, even as the bishop of the church... When somebody gets up there to do what they do, we'd have the sense to step aside and let them serve because their gift is the authority. Everybody tell somebody, you're my servant. And tell them again, I'm your servant. God's original intent for authority was to bless others. But man corrupted that authority to meet his own greed, to meet his own avaricious greed. And it turned out to be lecherous greed. Turned out to be treachery. And so in the corrupting of authority, we now have manipulation, which is the, the root of witchcraft. And so when man corrupted authority to meet his own greed, need, God then had to in introduce kings, dominion authority, versus civil authority and pre-spiritual authority versus occult authority, which we won't have time to look at. So kings then, in terms of kings and priests, we are kings and priests, which is God's dominative authority, how we then exercise dominion in the earth, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As kings, we assert kingdom dominion. But we have to also understand that we are living in a civil society where there are laws and rules that govern us. At some point, civil authority ceases. That's why the Bible talks about brothers and court. We're not going to go there now. And then we have priests, spiritual authority versus occult. The Bible says we have been made kings and priests before our God. Revelation 5, chapter number 10, and also Revelation 18, verse 2. Okay, let's look at the kingdoms of this world. Okay, on the left... He's the kingdom of man. That's the old man. That's the old man, the old nature, the way the flesh operates. 
On the right, you have Christ, which is the kingdom. And so we have these two different things pulling against us, hell on earth or heaven on earth, right at the bottom. We have civil, spiritual authority versus civil authority. Are we together? Spiritual authority versus civil authority. Spiritual authority comes from God's spirit, Ephesians 1.22. It is appointed by God for good, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to, th to 7. Civil authority is manipulated, but not organic and free. So generally what civil authority does is, what it, it, it's not evil, but what it does in preference to the kingdom of God, it leans towards serving the interests of man as opposed to serving the interests of Christ. The reason we have to have it is because man is unruly. And there are people that will never be born again, so we have to have contracts. And then we have to have lawyers that write our contracts, and then the contract that your lawyer wrote comes to the contract that comes to my lawyer that reads your contract, and they read something in there that may not have been intended. Or they see something there as a loophole, so they want to fix it, so it goes back and forward. And so something that could have been one page turns out to be voluminous. And that's true of almost anything. Tell somebody I'm not signing there. Baby, you sign. So let's look at spiritual authority versus civil authority. Spiritual authority is functional, related to actions. Civil authority is official, related to static office. I want to explain. Spiritual authority builds everyone in life and relationship. Civil authority separates into classes, titles, and ranks. Spiritual authority is like a father and child relationship pertaining to family. Civil authority is like a sergeant-private relationship in the army. It's more regimented. So a father will accommodate, a sergeant will... Spiritual authority operates through love in a household. Civil authority operates through delegation like a business. And it's not, we're not saying they're wrong. It's wrong. We're just giving an example. Spiritual authority is based on character. Civil authority is based on status, position. Spiritual authority is cooperative and persuasive. Civil authority is authoritarian and dominating. We're talking about the way you run a church, ministry. Okay. Let's go to levels of authority. When the Bible says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers or the governing authorities, for there's no authority except of God, the authorities that exist are appointed by God, what the Bible is referring to here, referring to here is governmental structure. It took me all that time to get here. On the top there in purple is the prophetic. For this we need to understand Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way to kings, because there's a journey in government. When we're dealing with spiritual authority, we have to look at the journey, because every person, family, church, slash business, is in a journey. As this church is on a journey. As the body of Christ corporately around the world is on a journey. What we are seeing in governmental structures today, with apostolic and prophetic structures as pertaining to authority, is not what it was 30 years ago. And so we have to understand some of that journey. And what different churches do administratively might be fine there. They might have to then begin to adjust and align to what is happening corporately. Let's put it to you in this way. I made a phone call the other day to somebody on a landline. That sounds like a rare species, a landline. A landline which may not be existing within the next number of years. I'm just assuming. Because when I called Dr. Phil the other day, I called him on a cell phone line that went through a switchboard. I was blown away. I didn't know that could happen. Ask somebody say, where has he been? I live in Roa. We still use those. <laughs> but that phone still works. Hello? Hello? My what? <laughs> it still works. But wouldn't it be better if you had 
a Nokia 1423. So there's nothing wrong with somebody having a landline phoning, using that phone. <laughs> Sounds like a James Bond movie. James Bond movie. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. It would be better if you upgraded. So there are churches in the world today that are still using old governmental styles but are behind in what God is doing currently. That I'm not implying or placating that where we are is right. I'm just saying that we are all part of the journey. I haven't had the kind of global exposure. You know, like when somebody says, I went to a restaurant in Iran last night. It's the best restaurant in the world. Well, you've not eaten in all the restaurants in the world. You can't say that. But we know what you mean. If you say, our bishop is the best bishop in the world, you haven't met all the bishops in the world. So you can't legitimately say that. But we know what you mean. My wife's the best wife in the world. Have you met all the wives in the world? <laughs> You're the best wife in the world, Chi Chi. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> So when people say things like, our church is the best church in the world, or we got the best choir in the country, well, we were on the front page. <laughs> mandla, mandla, it meant something else, mandla. <laughs> so let's look at some of this journey. I am the God of... Say that again. I am the God of Abraham. So under the Abrahamic covenant, there was a different governmental style. A different governmental style. And we see how Abraham enforces that when he's living with the 318 soldiers, Genesis 14, in his household. And he comes into covenant with God. And after they are circumcised, all the males in the house, we see how Abraham structures his house with the various levels of servants. Abraham changed his staff ten times. Because of the progression of where he was going. Then comes Isaac. Isaac's governmental style was different too. Then we have Jacob who has 12 sons. His governmental style is totally different. And so what we have from Jacob now, we have then the 12 tribes of Israel. How many tribes in Israel? How many tribes in Israel? Joseph was split in two. Levi was taken out to become the priesthood. Joseph was split in two to accommodate Manasseh and Ephraim. So when you read the blessing of Jacob on the sons and the blessing of Moses on the tribes, the blessing of Moses in Exodus, Iowa, Deuteronomy 33, he leaves out Simeon. Simeon is left out completely. And there's uh, historicity in that. There are cultural reasons for it. In Judaistic law, there are reasons why Simeon was left out. But he is included in the blessing of Jacob. Uh, and he's told he's a mean spirit. And so there are different dynamics in those particular blessings. But generally, how many tribes in Israel? How many tribes in Israel? How many tribes in Israel? All right. So it's a different governmental style. We see now, after the children of Israel go and live with Joseph, and they live in Goshen, and they're there for 400 years after a pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph imposes slavery on them, the slavery of 430 years, which we see in Genesis, in Exodus 3, verse 16, this, during those years of adverse conditions, difficult slavery, the governmental style changed to where now, while we are in slavery, as we begin a, an underground resistance for liberation, we are now going to have a hierarchical system within tribes. It's not formal, it's informal. What kind of government do you have? Informal. What kind of government do you have? It's not formal, it's informal. So that when the Bible says in Exodus that there was a woman of the tribe of Levi, whose name was Jochebed, that was pregnant with a child called Moses, the Bible at least identifies that she was from the tribe of Levi. But it was informal. And the Bible says, uh, as we progress here, that when Moses meets with God in the desert somewhere, and God speaks to him through a fiery burning bush, and Aaron shows up from somewhere. I don't know if Aaron got a pass that day from the Egyptians. And he meets Moses there. 
And uh, Aaron becomes the official spokesperson for an emerging new system. So Moses now comes as a liberator. And the first thing Moses does, he goes and he speaks to the elders in Israel. Who did he speak to? Who did he speak to? These elders of the tribes are informal. They just emerged during the 400 years. Everybody knew who they were. Now watch, let's go back. When Joseph invited his brothers and his dad to live in Goshen, all the brothers were alive, every one of them. They were all alive. And the scripture lists their sons. So they were all princes. So when did they stop becoming princes? When did they stop becoming princes? Because the more they had kids, the more unprincely they became. But amongst them, they knew who was the elders and who were not the sole elders. Are we together? Are we together? All right. And so Moses then addresses the elders. It's a different governmental style. So that is pre-Egyptian slavery. Then we have Egyptian slavery, 400 years. Now we have post-slavery. Say that. Say that again. In post-slavery, here comes Moses. He's got Aaron. And he's working with the elders. He gives them the instruction. He gives the demonstration. And they leave. Notice that none of these elders are mentioned. When they get to Elam in chapter number 15 of the book of Exodus, or is it 16, the Bible says there are 12 springs and 70 palms. How many springs? How many palms? 12 is for each tribe. Each tribe had a spring. Each tribe had a spring, which was connoting the authority that God had given each tribe in terms of its leadership. And there were 70 palms, but there were no appointed elders. 70. So what they had was a literal existence of the springs, 12, but a prophetic structure of what was coming in the future, which is Luke chapter number 9, he appointed 12 apostles, in Luke chapter number 10, he appointed another 70. Luke 10, 17, and the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. So what the 70 palms spoke of was what was yet to come. Everyone says progressive government. Now Moses is leading all the way. In Exodus chapter number 17, they come to Rephidim. And there Moses, with his apostolic rod, strikes the rock, and water comes out. The Amalekites want to take their monies, and also wants to capitalize on this water, and a battle begins. So the Bible says in chapter 17 of Exodus, Moses names Joshua as the captain of the army. So up until this point, they had no army, no captain, and Joshua is named the captain of the army. So we see government being produced. Okay, now, every authority is given to Every authority is given to? Every authority is given to? So when Joshua is appointed, he's appointed as the captain of the army, but he's given to? Moses now, who is at the young old age, the ripe old age of about 85, goes up a hill, and he sits up there checking out the battle. He's checking out the battle. And so when he lifts up his hands, you know the story, Israel starts prevailing. When he puts down his hands, the Hindu will start knocking those heads. I mean, here they come in from the golden night. Boom, boom, boom. Lift up your hands. Ooh, right in Syria. Put down your hands. Right in Lift up your hands. Everyone say, lift up your hands. And so, her, H U R, and Aaron said to Moses, We'll hold up your hands. But watch what they do. They take a rock. They set him on the rock. That rock was Christ. So he's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He doesn't know he's doing this. He just thinks he's sitting on a rock. But that rock was Christ. So Moses is seated as an apostolic leader, seated in Christ in heavenly places. On the right, he's got her, his brother-in-law, lifting up his hands. Her was 100 years old. He was married to Miriam, the prophet in Israel. And Aaron's on the other side, representing the priest, lifting up his hand. And Joshua's in the valley fighting the battle. So now you have an assimilation in post-slavery Israel, an assimilation of government. What they had during slavery was not wrong, but they couldn't maintain that level of government now in the wilderness. So the battle now is causing a governmental system to emerge. 
The struggles force us to go to the next level of governmental structure. Acts chapter number 6 and 7 releases deacons and calls for elders, etc., etc. Everyone say government. Say prophetic government. And so immediately after, in Exodus 17, you have the formation of this. In chapter number 18, Jethro then says to Moses, you can't be talking to everybody. You can't be counseling with everybody. What you need is to appoint captains of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, which Moses does. So he now creates another tier of leadership in their structure. They go around the wilderness, so on and so forth. They come now to Numbers 11. And God says, I'm going to take what's on you, Moses, and put it on 70 elders. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the 70 elders. So you now have another tier being added. This is a wilderness structure. What is this? It has the assimilation of apostolic and prophetic. It has the assimilation of that. See, they're moving through the wilderness, and this is how it's being led. They build a tabernacle. Tabernacle's in the center. The tri tribes are on the side. And they're told how to march through the wilderness. They're marching like a cross on the move. Because the way they were laid out in their tribes, Judah's in front and Dan's at the back. Judah leads the way. He inhabits the praise of his people. Ju Dan will judge his people. So what praise and worship breaks through, after every praise and worship session, after every praise and worship breakthrough, there has to be the judgment of Dan to judge what we've broken into. So as they're marching through now, there's a governmental structure that's constantly being rolled out. Everyone say government. Say that again. Now, here's possessing the land structure. Here's possessing the land structure. Notice, when Joshua goes into the promised land, he does not go in with Moses' structure. He goes with the priests in front. Who's in front? What are they carrying? Not lunch. What are they carrying? They're carrying the ark of the covenant. Where is the ark of the covenant? Why is it on their shoulders? Because the Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, and the government shall be upon. So now you have a different governmental style emerging. A different style emerging. So when the priests touch Jordan, phew, the government then for causes everything that's in opposition to roll back. Isaiah 16, 3, 4, 5, and 6 says that the tabernacle of David, which is the Ark of the Covenant in essence, is governmental. So now the priests are introducing a different governmental style. So everybody following behind now knows Joshua's our leader, but he's walking behind the priests. Watch. When they take Jericho, who's in front? The priests. What are they doing? They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. What's behind the Ark of the Covenant? Priests blowing trumpets. They got seven trumpets they blow in. So you now have a different governmental structure emerging under Joshua's leadership and Caleb's apostolic anointing. The two of them, one from Ephraim, one from Judah, the two of them have the priests leading the charge and, and possessing the land. So you have a different governmental structure. Nearly there. Let's go to the last one. From Joshua, we then have judges. We have judges. Because now the land is being settled. We now have judges that are going to start transitioning to God's intent. Judges, there were 14 judges. Each judge representing a 14 of the generations that are spoken of in Matthew. From Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to Zerubbabel are 14 generations. From Zerubbabel to Jesus are 14 generations. So the judges now are going to represent the generations. 14 judges. The most famous of those are Gideon and Samson and Jephthah. And there's Ead and others. Deborah. These judges now are going to lead Israel in transition from Joshua to kings. God's intention is kings. Going somewhere. Let's watch this now. In the book of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, from Bethlehem, we have two young people who are in the middle of a famine, and they take their boys, and they go to Moab. Because there was bread in Moab. Watch. They left Bethlehem, the seat, and the birthing of government. They left that, and went to Moab. 
and try to adapt a system of government that was not God's intent. It was not God's intent. And so the old man who represents apostolic leadership that's out of order dies there. And then the two boys who marry Orpha or Oprah and Ruth, those boys can't have kids with these girls, and they die there. And so whenever you have ministry that leaves God's perfection for revelation from Bethlehem, that's the birthing place, and goes to a different system to try to adapt government, it kills fathers and sons. It kills fathers and sons. They die when you have inappropriate government because there's no generational blessing. Judges, 14 judges means that a new generation is beginning. But we're not going to begin it with a Moabitic system. We're not going to deal with Lot and how Moab came into being. So after some time, Naomi says, I heard there's bread up there in Bethlehem. So she says to Orpha and to Ruth, go back to your people. And so Orpha goes back, which is a type of Old Testament going back to its system. But Ruth says to Naomi, I'll go with you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I'll die. Your people are my people. Da, da, da. And so she comes to Bethlehem. When she gets to Bethlehem, she meets Boaz. Boaz Stan. She meets Boaz Stan. When she meets Boaz, now she's back in the right place. She's got the Messiah swimming in her. She doesn't know it. Now we are ready to start the journey for apostolic government, for kingship. She marries Boaz. They have a son. His name is Obed. He has a son whose name is Jesse. He has eight sons. One of them is David. David then becomes the king of Israel. And so what happens while that is emerging, it's always amazing how a system that's not perfection tries to creep in. You have Saul and David. The not so good and the good. And there's always that struggle between David and Saul. Here's my closing. What we have in the world today, we have systems that are battling with each other. And what God is trying to bring us to is apostolic fathers, leading and directing prophetic sons to bring order and direction. And the role of the prophetic father, father, <laughs> father is to ensure that the sons that are coming up are living in authority, in submission. Not to them only, but to God's intent, to God's purpose. So what we try to do in your lives is to release in your lives what God's intent is in terms of apostolic authority. So when David comes, he's going to represent what we now call the tabernacle of David, which is government. And so when we're dealing with levels of authority and submission to authority, we have to look at God's intent. So with all the kinds of things emerging all over the place, in Harari included, you know, ministries emerging uh, in the United States and so on and so forth, what we want to know is our people being in alignment with apostolic authority. Are they serving in a governmental anointing? Are they working with that? Now, anybody in this church can start a church. It's a free world. But if you're not in alignment with apostolic authority then you're going to get yourself into serious problems. Because what will happen is you'll have an Absalom, you'll have uh, Tamar, you'll have all these boys just running, ra ransacking the whole place. And it's going to take generations to get a Solomon to bring order back. Wisdom through Proverbs and understanding of Ecclesiastes to bring it back into order. And so if anybody here, for whatever reason, feels you want to start a church, or have a principality, or develop a kingdom, you have to do it in the right manner because you are subject to the higher authority. Because you can't be here and establish an authority if you're not subject to an authority. Kuda's got a great preaching gift. He's a great kid. Awesome man. Someday he'll probably pastor a church. But you can't just jump out and go start a church here. Because what are you under? If you're not under anything, you are under then damnation. If you're not under something, you are under damnation. And it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time. This is true of everything. It's true of everything we do. So if you look at the, the tracking of the way God does things, let's read one more scripture. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 33. Deuteronomy 33. 
Moses begins to, to uh, literally lay a blessing on all the tribes, all the way from verse 1, all the way down. Verse 27. Verse 27. In the conclusion of the last tribe he's speaking to here, he says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are everlasting arms. And he will thrust out the enemy from before you, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land, upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heaven shall drop down dew. Did one say a land of corn and wine? He had told him it was a land of milk and honey, but he's saying it's a land of corn and wine. Corn is revelation. Wine is spirit, which is spirit. And it's gonna, heavens are going to be open over your head, and Israel will be happy. And who is like unto you, O people of Israel, saved by the Lord? And he, he lays a tremendous blessing on this entire nation. Now, after he does that, after he does that, let's go to chapter number 34, verse 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye wasn't dim, which means Moses still had a clear eye for revelation. He wasn't blind. He wasn't wearing glasses. Moses could see clearly. He had the gift of revelation. His eyes were not dim. And his natural force wasn't abated. Moses was 120 years old and ran up a mountain. He's 120 and he's running up a mountain. He's leaving guys like Clive and them behind. And the scripture is very clear. Verse 9. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of Moses. Verse 9. Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. Why? 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 Why was he full of the spirit of wisdom? It wasn't because he was 85 years old and had gone through all of this and he had gone through a wilderness and uh, because who did what? He said, Israel, you're a great nation. There's none like you. Corn and wine's coming to you. The heaven's going to open over your head. With all of those great things, all of those things that God said will happen to you, they couldn't do it without Joshua. And Joshua couldn't do it without a man whose eye was clear. His eye was clear. He could see in the middle of the night. He was trained by his father-in-law, Jethro, a Moabite. And their gift was to see in the night. They had luminous vision. Moses could see clearer than any person in history. Look at the books he wrote. And if you don't have a father whose eyes clear, there's a problem. And whose bodily strength. He's not talking about his physical strength. It's a metaphor. If you have a hungry father, you have trouble. Hungry fathers are problems. If you are serving a hungry father, ah, you'll be paying offerings all your life. They take stuff from you. Hungry sons are a problem. Because they'll fellowship with pigs. Ask the prodigal son in 15 of Luke. The father wasn't hungry. When the hungry son came home, the father was waiting for him. Gave him a ring, gave him a coat, put shoes on his feet, laid his hands on him, and said, what is mine is yours. And when the son was out there, he said, I know my father's house. I'm a son, but the servants are eating better than people here in Moab. I'm going back to my father's house. So Joshua had hands laid on him by his father Moses, because his eye was clear. Now watch what the scripture says. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Isn't that amazing? Who wrote that? Who wrote that? When did he write that? He wrote that before he went to see Jesus. Verse number 11. In all signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and to all his land in all the mighty hand in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all of Israel. So you have a governmental transition. But when you read Joshua chapter number 1. Let's go to Joshua 1. Joshua 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua saying, Moses is dead. God had to tell them. 
Because you know people are so crazy. Peep, t- tell somebody people are crazy. No, tell the person next to you, you crazy. No, you really are. People are crazy. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. If Moses had died in that camp, they would have started a mosaic religion worshiping the man. Yes, they would have. That's why they buried him in the sea. Moses went by himself. And they were like, well, you know, we'll just wait here. He'll, he's coming back. We'll wait here. One time he went for 40 days and they were like, so they thought he was one of, on one of his long walks. God said, hey, the man is dead. All right. Now look at the promise. Moses, my servant, is dead. Verse 2. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. You and all these people. I'll give everything to you. Every place you put your feet. It's a different era now. I will give you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness of Levi, oh, I'm going to be all of that. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Bible says there was no prophet like Moses. That was Moses wrote. That's what Moses wrote. But he went to go sleep. And while he was sleeping, God said, that's what Moses said. That's what I'm telling you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Moses spoke face to face, so will you. You did mir- he did miracles, so will you. Everywhere you put your foot, foot so will you. So what Moses did, he laid it on there and then God came and ordained it and said, it is so. Stand. For every prophet, every gift, every spiritual anointing, whatever they are, needs to be under something. Don't dare make the mistake of saying the Holy Spirit is teaching me. No. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He gave teachers. He gave instruction. Now, God will show you something. You don't have to be, uh, some people want to be led. Now, Lord, should I wear a blue dress, a purple dress, and a red dress? Just make sure you got one on. Should I have ham or bacon? See, some people spiritualize everything, and it creates an imbalance. What you need is you need somebody that can direct your life and lead your life. Father, we pray your blessing. We pray your blessing. Thank you for joining Bishop Tudor Bismarck for this powerful teaching. Chabula New Life Ministries is empowering millions of people around the world through dynamic preaching and teaching, humanitarian aid, and many other ministry efforts. For additional information and resources from Bishop Tudor Bismarck, please visit our website at www.chabula.org or call 469-272-7337. We look forward to serving you in the kingdom.